everybody, it's Thursday night and we are at Now You're Cooking for another cooking demo with our friend Jeff Mao, who has this really fun new cookbook called Essential Chinese Hot Pot Cookbook. And that is what we're gonna make tonight. And All we're right. really excited about this. We have a really fun new um, hot pot cooker or heater. And um, so we're gonna be using that. But before we get to that, you gotta make your broth and we've got to gonna talk about a whole lot of stuff here. So let's get started, Jeff. We got All a lot right. to do. Excellent, so I've been accused of using every dish in the kitchen and this, this definitely does it. We're gonna make two broths tonight. It's kind of a classic pairing. One of them is what uh, I think a lot of people know of when you're talking about Chinese hot pot. It's that red, deep red, super spicy Sichuan chili broth. Uh, and then the one that goes in pair with it oftentimes in, in something like this, which is a split pot. There's two different bras in there is what's called the uh, mandarin clear broth or mandarin duck clear broth. Mandarin duck part is not because there's duck in there, but literally mandarin ducks, if you ever see them in Beijing, they pair for life. And so you always have a male and a female and they mate for life and they hang around together for their entire lives. So the term mandarin duck in Chinese means kind of paired, you know, a, a couple. And so in this case, these two broths are often paired together because the mandarin broth is very... Uh, light, it's not spicy, and then of course the other one is kind of knock your head off spicy if you want it to be. Um, and, and so that's why we're going to make these two together. And they're actually, both of these we figured out are both vegan, not just vegetarian, but right. vegan. And so yeah, so my preparation is vegan, you can make them not that way, mm -hmm. um, but the way I'm doing it today they will be vegan. And so traditionally the Sichuan broth is made with a beef broth, um, but I've been typically using the, the um, better than bullion's no beef vegetarian version to make the broth. Uh, and then also traditionally it's made with beef tallow, which is hard to source in the United States, easier just to use regular vegetable oil. And that makes it a lot simpler. All right, so we've got a bunch of different ingredients. I'm gonna start with the, the red Sichuan broth, which a um, couple things that we didn't advance, just so you know, this is actually um, Sichuan chili, uh, red peppers, Sichuan red peppers, right? And so these peppers, oftentimes, this is not what creates heat, but they create this kind of mind, mouth numbing, tingly sensation in, in the mouth. And that's where the ma la comes from. La is the, is the heat and ma meaning spicy, uh, numbing. So it's numbing heat. That's where the ma la broth comes from. And so when you use these, uh, these are actually from the prickly ash tree, so they're not even really a pepper and you want the casing. So as you go through these, you'll find these little round black pearls. You actually want to try and separate them out because if you bite into one, it's kind of like biting a piece of sand when you're having clams and they weren't really washed well. Yeah. So do the best you can, try and get them out. I ground them up, added some five spice powder to this, and then just soaked it in some water because what we're gonna do is I'm gonna, eventually this is all gonna go into this pot with oil. So the first thing we're really doing is building kind of a chili oil. And if, if you put the spices in dry, they'll burn too fast, okay. right? And then likewise, we have here, these are the actual chilies. And so I'm using two different kinds of chilies. One is just kind of a Sichuan red chili pepper. And this is what is referred to as a lantern pepper, right? So I think in its non-dried version, I'm gonna say a lantern pepper is probably similar to a habanero. You can see its shape. And then these are similar to like a cayenne or an arbol pepper. Where, where do you get all, because a lot, so we have some of these spices. We have Griffin Ridge, obviously. Right. But we don't have dried peppers. Um, we don't have yep. like a lot of the spices. So yeah, so both of these, so this is the, the, the red chilies and these are the lanterns. These actually came from Portland down at the Hong Kong market. So if you're in the main region, you can find them in Hong Kong market down on Congress Street. Uh, but you can easily definitely find them online. Lots of resellers obviously sell these things online. Uh, the nice thing is they're dried, so they're light, they ship easy as opposed to buying things that are in bottles that are heavy and, and yeah. don't ship so easy. All right, so let's see here. First thing I want to do, though, I've got these things soaked, and then I want to get some oil. I put some oil in here already. So the first thing I want to put in here, though, is some scallions, ginger, garlic. And so if you've seen Chris do some of these things, he'll tell you this is the Chinese flavor base. So we'll get these going um, and get them in the oil, and you can kind of hear them sizzling already. And just let those get started. And they're just going to kind of do their thing just to get them moving. So how much time do you want to plan? Because broth isn't going to be done as soon as you're done right. cooking it, right? So probably you're going to need a, I mean, including the prep time and everything else, it might take you a little over an hour. In the actual once now that we've got this going, probably in about 45 minutes, this broth would be ready okay. to use. 
Um, so today we're going to prepare the broth about 90% of the way there, except for that kind of now cover and simmer for the next 40 minutes. We've already got some broth prepared and then we'll jump right into that. Um, so this is get going here. And then for the chilies, what we want to do, these have been soaking in water for some time. The lantern chilies have these little stems on them that are a bit chewy. And so usually I try and pull those things off if they're there um, as best I can. And then the other ones are fine, but and then we're going to dice this up into a paste, and we're going to add them to here. So let me just get these things done. And, uh, and you soak them for about an hour or so. Or? So these probably, if you use hot water, about a half hour is long enough to get them soft. They've actually probably been sitting here for an hour, but at least a half an hour just to really kind of soften them up. Plus, get them soaked through so that um, again, when they hit the oil, they don't burn really quick because you don't want them to burn. But you. You know, so it's, it's an interesting concept because, of course, if you start with fresh chilies, you'd have to, to cook them for a really long time to get the water out. Yeah. On the other hand, we're using dried chili, so we need to add some water to drive it back out just so it doesn't burn, right? So it. it's, it's kind of a back-and-forth process of rehydrating a dried pepper just so that we don't burn it, right? And then these are fine. And then this, of course, this is one of those things, <coughs> and I can already smell it just picking these up. I'll tell you, I'm so I'm, you I'm really supposed to be wearing gloves and this kind of thing because now that I'm handling all these things, Everything's I'll just make sure I don't touch my face. <laughs> um, Stem. Stems, yeah. So this water, I'm sure if you drank it, would be quite fiery and not pleasant at all. Uh, we're not going to even use that. But otherwise, I'm just going to kind of give this stuff a, a rough chop. If you had a Cuisinart, I think because it's wet, you could use that. Do you um, want it ideally really totally pureed or do you want it kind no, of No, I think it's a bit chunky is fine. I mean, you know, this is all going to stay in the broth. So this is one of those broths that when we're done, we're not going to strain out the solids. And so depending on your diners, they may or may not want a mouthful of this. On the other hand, the, the finer you grind this, uh, the more heat that comes out, right? Because you're just creating more and more surface area. So. Yeah. And the, seeds and all are going in. Seeds and all are going in. And then the other way to temper the heat is just simply how much you use. So if you, in the cookbook, you'll see the recipe says one to three cups, right? And so... That's a big difference. That's a big difference. But uh, some people really like it hot. Some people not so much. And you just kind of have to know your diners and make a decision as to how hot you want to make this. Um, all right. So that looks pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and just add these in to this. Sizzle, sizzle. Sizzle, sizzle, right. And then likewise, we'll add in these guys. So this is both the Sichuan chilies and um, some five spice powder and a couple bay leaves that have been ground up as well. Can I just use this one? Yeah. There we go. All right. Okay, and then in the meantime, for this other broth, and you don't have to do these at the same time, but we're doing them because it's the magic of TV for you. Um, I've been soaking a couple of these dried shiitake mushrooms, right? In hindsight, looking at this recipe, I realized it's probably a somewhat unnecessary step in that we're going to put all of this stuff in, and before we actually serve this broth, we will strain out all the solids. Okay. So whether or not you pre-soak these or they just simply bubbled away in the water later, you're probably going to end up in the same place. But nonetheless, I've got these things soaked, and then I've got, again, same thing. I've got some ginger, or garlic and ginger, right? Um, and you don't care how big those are because they're, again, so these, Yeah, strange. these are going to come back out again, and so it's actually easier sometimes with big chunks. So let me get, add this stuff in here. So here goes the garlic into there and the ginger those go in there All right so let me make sure i'm getting everything in there garlic and ginger oh and then the scallion so we just want the white parts of the scallion first the green parts we'll add later after the broth has been strained and transferred into the hot pot then we'll throw some in there if we cook them now they're just going to cook down and, and wilt out um, so that's no fun right and then we'll let these things go just for a little bit Uh, I have been cooking for as long as I can remember, and some of this stuff is a combination of just, I think, you know, like a lot of people, reading, reading other cookbooks, going online, 
uh, talking with other family members. You know, my sister spent about seven, eight years living in China recently. My father grew up in China. So being able to talk to a lot of those folks as well to kind of get a sense of how all this works. Um, you know, it's been interesting, especially the hot pot stuff, because it's something I grew up eating, but typically, even in my own household, my grandmother used to have us for hot pot, but it was mostly, she wouldn't make fancy broth. She would usually just throw water in the thing, and we would go from there, or just plain chicken broth, yeah. uh, which is fine. And if you go to the, like, the most popular hot pot chain in China, the Heidi Lao, you know, one of the options on the menu is simply water. You don't have to get all these different fancy broths, but a lot of people like to do it. Yeah. But some people would just say, well, just give me some water, right? All right, so these are going... I'm going to add in these mushrooms along with the, the soaking liquid. Right. And I want to add in the dates. So these are red, dried red Chinese dates. Right. You can, these are easiest. I found these online. I couldn't even find them at the local Chinese market. Um, but they'll add a little bit of a sweetness to that. Do they have a pit in them? Um, you know, like I could you eat those? Just eat them like a date? You can. Because I know that other members of my family and older generations would chew on them like in the car when we were just driving around somewhere. Um, I don't think they have pits. I think they've been pitted. Um, all right. So those are in. That's okay. It, it keeps me going here. And then, okay. And so then this from here, this is pretty much ready to go. We're just going to add some water to this. Um, How much water would so you we like? So we can put in about, you know, normally we'd probably put in about eight to 10 cups of water, but I think as long as we put in about four cups for now, it's good enough. People will also been asked, like, what's the right amount of water for a broth? Remember, as the broth cooks, it's just gonna keep evaporating. And of course, the less water that's there, the more concentrated the flavor is gonna be, but in the end, you can always just add in more water later. It doesn't really affect the cooking at this stage to have not enough water, so to speak, as long as there's enough that it's not gonna. Right. You know, so and that already has the mushroom water, so it's right. not going to go... Right, it's not going to not going to blow up on so us. So I'm just adding this. Yep, yep. And that is it. That looks really, really good and kind of simple. And right, yet. and so this is the really simple broth. Yeah. Yep. And so now this one is really just going to simmer now for about 35, 45 minutes. And then at the end, we'll end up straining those things out and then add in... We've got a little bit of sugar, a little bit of actually MSG, okay. um, because that's what makes things taste like Chinese food even though some people don't like it. If you don't want to do the MSG thing, just use salt, right? Uh, and then we've also got some goji berries, which will get added at the last minute, and then some, some chopped green peppers, uh, green onion, just the green parts, right? And that, so that gets added to this at the very end. So everything except for the green onions are already in this one over here, so we'll just add some green onions to that one. Okay, so this one over here, though, this stuff has been simmering along. I'm going to add the oil now. And so this is two cups of just plain vegetable oil. Again, in, the, in a more traditional world, they would be using beef tallow. Um, is beef tallow like suet? I believe so. It's, it's a rendered fat, right? And, and uh, So this, though, really, if, if you've ever made any kind of hot chili oil, this is what this is now. This is just a chili oil that... Um, let me turn up the heat a little bit on this one. This way, right? There we go. And so this is just going to sit here and, and bubble away, and it's going to start extracting flavors out of what we've already got in there. And then we're going to add in some more things once it gets going. So this is in there, and then I want to add in some more stuff. So I've got, this is uh, chili paste. So this is a broad bean paste from the Sichuan province. There's a lot of them. Uh, so it's really easy to go into the Asian markets and kind of get confused as to which one is which. In fact, I can't even find this stuff locally. I end up always mail ordering this stuff. But I've been trusting this brand that has these three yellow triangles um, on it. And what does that say? And so I have no, I think it says something like Pichian County and then broad bean paste or something to that effect. So kind of like wines where they're regional, you know, Burgundy wine versus, you know, so Loire Valley, whatever. These pastes come from different places. And the one that comes from, th that from Pichian County is, or it might just be P County because I think the Xi'an might be, Xi'an I think means city, so. Um, but that's the version I've been using, and this is the one that I like the most. And if, so if you like Sichuan food, often this is the flavor base of Sichuanese foods. Right. It's that kind of uh, funky, hot, spicy stuff. And so that's what this we is. We probably get a picture of that later and put it on Facebook and on our website so people can see the, what the label looks like to order it. Yeah, and... There's, you'll find that you can either order it in what looks kind of like a box or this jar. If you buy it in the box, what you'll find is inside the box is a plastic bag. And then you'll need to empty it into a jar. Right. So I 
bought it by the jar. It made it a little bit easier. So anyway, in went that along with uh, some chili flakes. So these are Sichuan chili flakes. So these are kind of essentially these peppers, but flaked. Um, although they're not quite as dry. They never are as qu quite as dry as what these are. And so there's a little bit more to them. So even though we have the soaked whole ones, dried whole we got ones, more. we're still adding more. Still adding more. That's what really makes this thing fiery. Um, and then these are black beans. So these are fermented black beans. These are not the same as a black turtle bean, right? Like the way we eat in Mexican food. So this is actually a black soybean that has been fermented. Uh, and so this also kind of adds a salty uh, umami kind of funk flavor to it, right? And so those are all in. Let me get this, stir this up. So you can start to smell, I mean, you, yeah, you can smell as it's filling the room. Once again, we need smell-o-vision here. Yeah. It does, it but. is pretty incredible, folks. This, oh, it's really, really yummy. Okay, and so the last thing we're going to add to this is the stock. So we can, so I'm going to turn this down a little bit and just kind of let it. And does that want to cook a while before we add the stock or? So just it, probably another five, ten, five minutes it's going to cook and then we would add the stock and with the stock then we would add some black cardamom pods. And so these come from the Griffin Ridge. These are pretty little in relative terms to you can see in comparison this bag are the ones that come from the Chinese market. So they and may be so Chinese and Indian or... Potentially, yeah, hard to know or just somehow they harvest them early, I don't know. But these ones I used when I developed the recipe so the recipe says two. Then I, then I bought the local Griffin Ridge version and I looked at them and I thought, well, maybe I'll use four. <laughs> so we've got four of those. We'll add those along with, again, we've got some salt and or sugar, I should say, and, and um, more MSG so and a little bit of Shaoxian wine, which is kind of traditional Chinese cooking what's wine. What's the deal with MSG? So MSG, interestingly, it's, it really dates back to this one kind of letter to the editor thing. Some, some doctor wrote something to the New England Journal of Medicine saying that, geez, every time I go to Chinese restaurants, I get, you know, kind of headaches, this, that, and the other thing. I think it must be the MSG. And then other people started writing and saying, yeah, yeah, me too. But there was no scientific evidence behind it. And then they've done countless numbers of studies. And except for similar to, like, say, gluten, if someone is, has celiac, they really are intolerant. Um, but for most people, it, there's really no effect. And if they do kind of the blind tests, it doesn't affect you. And MSG isn't, you know, I think people look at this and they think, well, this is some sort of, uh, you know, factory chemical thing. You know, it's, this is a chemistry lab, but it, it actually isn't. So if you take a lot of things like sweet potatoes and other things that have glutamates in them, and then they ferment them in the same way that uh, certain bacteria, the ones that we always use for like beer, wine, bread, when they ferment, they produce alcohol. Right? In this case, these output, the, there's a different form of bacteria that then form glutamates. And then they took those glutamates and they just simply bonded them to sodium. That's where you get the monosodium because it's easier than to make it crystallize. And then you can put it back in the food. So this actually comes from things like sweet potatoes and, and carrots and other foods that now in factories, they ferment them, extract out that one piece of it, and then crystallize it with the sodium ions. And so that's what it is. So it's really not some chemistry lab that's making something. It is just a naturally fermented food. Uh, and then it is this, a Japanese scientist uh, it, around the turn of the night, you know, 20th century, right, early 1900s, is the one who kind of discovered it based on seaweed because it's, it's, it's very present in seaweed and yeah. was kind of realizing, like, why is this soup always so meaty? Why does it always taste so good? And figured out, oh, that's, that was the flavor compound that was doing it. So he originally was using seaweed and extracting it from there. Uh, and then later they figured out, oh, we can do this with things like sweet potatoes and other things like that. Interesting. So monosodium glutamate is not necessarily bad for you unless you have... Unless, unless you truly have, have an allergy of some problems. sort, right. And of course, the, this is all coming from the MSG industry, but those who make this stuff will tell you, well, because it's monosodium, there's fewer sodium ions and, and whatnot in this per, in the volume as compared to salt. So that, that's why sometimes you'll see this simply labeled as a low salt substitute, Aha. right? Uh, a lot of people say, oh, MSG, I don't, want, I don't want that. And in fact, say my publisher said, MSG, I don't know if we want to put MSG in there. So I switched it to Accent, which you can see in the stores, right? That little white bottle with the red label, right? Salt and it's been in stores since the middle 1900s. It's MSG, 100%. But it's labeled as accent, and so nobody thinks, oh, it's accent, it's flavor salt. 
yeah. and people use it and they don't realize, oh, it's the same thing. Yeah. So it's, it's been on shelves in the United States for years. People have been using it. Anything that you eat that you can't stop eating, potato chips, Doritos, all that stuff, they've packed it full of this stuff because it gets in your brain and you just yeah. say, ooh, I'm just going to keep eating. Um, those darn so, well, yeah, it's, 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 it's one of those things that you really, you can't avoid it. If you think you're not eating it and you're only getting it when you go to a Chinese restaurant, it's not really true. And then, unfortunately, I think you get a little bit of kind of that psychological effect because some restaurants will now advertise, we don't use MSG, which then makes you think, well, the fact that you're telling me you're not using it means probably better. means that there's something wrong by using it. But really, it's just because people have said, well, I don't want it. I don't want it because I've heard these stories about how it's not good. So... I'm going to get you water for So this. let's get some water for this, and then we will add in and use some of this uh, better than bullion. Again, you can use any sort of um, beef broth that you want, or if you don't want to use beef broth, you can use vegetable broth or chicken broth or, or whatever works for you. Do you want that in here or right in there? Uh, go ahead and just go right in there, because this, this stuff doesn't, this is so thick and goopy. Do you want more? Um, let's put in one more, just to Thin it out a little bit. Okay, and then so I'm going to add in the black cardamom pods and some sugar and the MSG. Stir that around. And then Shaoxian wine, which is kind of your standard Chinese cooking wine. Mirror in here, and that is not the same. Not the same, in the same way that you know, uh, a Sauvignon Blanc is not a Burgundy. It's, it's a different wine. I think Mirren is a little bit sweeter. Okay. Um, if you can't, can't pinch, could you use it? Sure. I mean, I think in in something like this, um, especially if you don't know what it tastes like with it, you're not going to notice the difference. Um, and even if you knew what it tasted like before, you might not notice it that much, right? Yeah. Because it's the, the little bit of sweetness that you might get from the mirror is probably going to be completely overwhelmed by all the chili peppers anyway. But the sweetness is there to try and balance things. So it, it might help a little bit in the balancing act if you find that that heat is a little too much for you. But in that case, just use less, less pepper, right? Less pepper. All right, so these things are simmering and going. Um, but let's, let's look at what we've actually got here in front of us because... For those of you who are kind of looking at this and looking at this kind of red broth that I've made that looks like liquid fire, uh, and some people think that's kind of what it is, right? Um, the broth itself isn't particularly this red one, is not one that people typically would drink like a soup. So a hot pot is really more like barbecue. If someone says, hey, I'm having a barbecue. It doesn't actually tell you what you're going to eat, right? You just know you're going to this... this uh, occasion and you know there's going to be a grill and so it kind of describes like how the food's going to get cooked so if someone says hey we're going out for a hot pot it's telling you this is how the food's going to get cooked and so at the table at a hot pot meal you're going to find a bunch of raw foods so we've got in front of us a bunch of vegetables mushrooms other things and we're going to cook the foods in the broth uh, and then of course when you cook it in the red broth and as we said there's there's a lot of oil in there and it's floating on the top so as the food falls down and up that that coats it and of course a lot of the flavor compounds are oil soluble so they get in the oil and especially the heat and that carries then into your food right the other thing that is is really popular with chinese hot pot would be then eating uh, or having a dipping sauce in your bowl and so often you'll cook the food in the pot and then into your bowl where you have a dipping sauce and then eating it the dipping sauce bars in a hot pot restaurant look like a salad bar they'll have 20 30 40 different ingredients that you can make your own and oftentimes they'll have little cards that tell you you know here's our special restaurant sauce you know a spoon of this and two spoons of that so I, there's a number of different recipes in the book but you can also just kind of make make what you want to make so uh, tonight i thought we might make a little bit of just kind of a sesame cilantro you know sesame oil with cilantro and a little bit of other stuff in it uh, just to test it out but this we can kind of to crank up but let's kind of go through these things here so on this plate here i've got some greens these were all purchased down at the Hong Kong market in Portland. Um, and so I left some of these uncut. So this is Chinese broccoli. And if you look at this, you can actually see right up here at the top, there's the kind of typical broccoli florets that you're used to seeing, but Chinese broccoli is much leafier and lots of stock. Um, these are bok choy. And I think we've probably all seen bok choy that looks like this, but really big. So this is not bok choy that was harvested young, although they call it dwarf bok choy. Uh, it's literally just a, a 
different version of the same plant, right? Um, so this is called dwarf bok choy, whereas this is also bok choy, sometimes referred to as Shanghai bok choy uh, or baby bok choy, but it too is not the regular bok choy that you see in a store that looks a lot more like this but big. It's just another plant, but in English it's just easier. They call them all bok choy, right? Uh, but all three of these are great greens. This one's obviously got it more crunch because it's got the big thick stems. And then over here we've got a couple soy products. So this is regular dofu, but if you look at it, you'll see the texture looks a little off. I froze the dofu, and then after freezing it, you can see I, I could have probably pressed it a little bit more. A lot of liquid comes out of these when you freeze it. And then, of course, when you do press it and get the liquid out and then cook it in the broth, it soaks in all the flavor, right? And then over here we have dried bean curd stick, which looks like this in the store, right? And you have to soak it for a good six, eight hours in just cold water, and it rehydrates. So as they're cooking the soybean mash to make dofu, just like when you're boiling milk making hot chocolate, you end up with kind of that skin on the top of the milk. Mm -hmm. They pull that skin off and dry it, and you get those. It's a big, usually a big round thing from the pot, but they just kind of bundle it up into, and then they lay it over something to dry, and you end up with these sticks, right? And so that's another soy product. There's a lot of protein in these. So for those of you who are plant-based, these are two great sources of protein, right? This, these are kind of chewy, um, not a ton of flavor in the same way that dofu is, is more of a flavor carrier. You, it brings flavors with it. These have so many little kind of crags and bits and wrinkles in them that when you put them in the broth and into your into your uh, dipping it sauce, it, it soaks it up. Yeah, we've got a bunch of mushrooms here. So these we got just in downtown Brunswick at the Morning Glory Market. These are just your regular shiitake mushrooms. These are hanshine mushrooms. So before we would eat, we would actually probably break those up, but you can easily by hand just kind of break them into small bits of one or two mushrooms at a time. But I wanted to show you how they looked this way. These are mayatake mushrooms or hen of the wood, right? And so that's another great kind of meaty mushroom. Same thing, we can just break it up by hand into smaller bits for cooking. And then over here, the, this one with kind of the purplish pinkish speckles is taro root, right? And so that's what this is over here before it's been peeled and cut, just so you can kind of see. So when you go, this is also from the Hong Kong market down in Portland. You can get that, peel it with a regular vegetable peeler and then just slice it. And it's a root vegetable. So when we're eating hot pot, oftentimes people will put the root vegetables in early and don't overfill the pot because you don't want to both overfill it, but also it just slows the cooking down. But if you know you're going to eat a slice of that, put in one or two and let them cook for a little while while you're cooking something else. Then we have here, this is lotus root, right? And so this is a, a crunchy um, root. So this is what is kind of beneath the lotus leaves that float on a pond and uh, that you see. And then over here, this is um, rice stick. And so that's kind of a rice product that's been ground up and they turn it into a stick. It's kind of chewy, but once you've cooked it for a little while on the broth, it softens up. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of got its own mouth feel to it. So a lot of Chinese food is texture based, more so than flavor based, right? And then these are um, fish balls. This fish ball is one that was made to be kind of imitation lobster. So since we're in Maine, I picked up those, but if you go to the Hong Kong market and go into the back of the market to the refrigerator case or the freezer case, you'll find all kinds of different fish balls, some which are just straight fish, some have uh, ground meat inside, some of them have fish roe inside, Right, all different kind of varieties of fish balls, so those are very popular. You can also find shrimp balls. You can also make shrimp balls. Fish balls are a little bit harder to make just because it's a little bit of effort to get the fish into a paste that will actually hold together. Uh, but a Cuisinart definitely helps with that process. Same thing with the shrimp, but the shrimp goes pretty quick. Um, and we have some thinly sliced pork here and then some, some regular kind of noodles. These are some dried noodles. Usually for these, to cook them in the hot pot, it's best to probably pre-soak these in some water before the meal, I just didn't open these up because there's just a couple of us here and we'll never get through all of this food. <laughs> um, and then I didn't chop these up, but it's very common to have other root veggies like, you know, just a regular potato or sweet potato um, so that you kind of have a whole variety of foods. Oftentimes there's more seafood. You might have prawns or sliced fish, you know, and, and you can really kind of deck these spreads out and get really big. And it just depends on how many people you've got eating. So if there's really just a couple of you this is probably more food than the, than, than the few of us who are here are going to be able to eat. So uh, what I love about this is all of the colors, the shapes, the like you said, the textures. Like there's so much going on here. It's really beautiful. Like just the the setup is gorgeous. Yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. And so then, so when you've got a, a hot pot cooker on your table, typically what you'd want to do is set that kind of right in the middle. Um, the nice thing about having a real hot pot cooker like this is not very tall. Like if you use a pot like this. Because some people will use like a camp stove or a, an electric kind of hot plate. 
But if you use a pot like this, it's so tall that when you're seated at the table, you can't see into it. And everyone's always standing up to see in to, to fish out food. And if you have to sit up and sit down and sit up and sit down every time you want to take a bite, it's very tiring. <laughs> and you're, and you're burning yeah. all those calories. So, right. end up eating. so this is a better way to go to have one of these. Just make sure you keep track of the electric cable. Usually what I'll do with, when I use an electric one is I'll, I'll run along the table and then tie it to the table leg so. and then make sure it's in a place where it's a low traffic zone and yep. just tell people don't walk over there so you don't drag the thing off the table. So how many um, people would this serve? Typically? So this, I think, you, depending on your table, you can probably fit about six people around one of these. Okay. Once you get to about eight, you might want to get two of them because it just gets, it's hard to fit eight people at a table who can all reach right. the hot pot, particularly then with all of this food surrounding it. But right? it's plenty of broth and everybody's going to be doing this all at the same time. Sure. So you just have to remember what you put in there. Right. Or you just, or you just steal someone else's food. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, and so that's where you kind of get into hot pot etiquette. Some folks, you know, you, you, there's, there, people are often divided into two camps in hot pot eating. Some people just keep putting lots of food in right? Way more than they're eating at that moment. And some people think, well, if I'm going to eat a piece of tofu, I'm going to put a piece of tofu in there and I'm going to wait for it, right? And so there is a notion of you, want, you don't want to overcrowd the pot because you can see this is simmering now and that's great. And you want it to continue to be simmering because you want it hot enough to cook things, particularly if you're cooking like raw meat, right. raw you fish, raw chicken, cool right? You don't want to cool it off. And so if you dump a lot of food in there, the temperature will drop, right? So if it does go down, the nice thing is right in the front there, there's that little temperature slide. You can just slide it up a little bit get a little bit hotter. And then of course you can see this is steaming, right? So yeah. as time goes on, you're gonna keep replenishing the pot with more. So when you make one full recipe, there's more broth here than would fit here. Um, if you had a single pot set up that didn't have the divider, you might be able to fit almost all of this in there. But typically if you do a split pot, it doesn't all fit, but you're gonna need to keep replenishing the pot anyway, yeah. right? Awesome. Do you wanna make a quick sauce? So let's make a quick sauce here. Bowl. All right, so we'll... If we want to put the sauce right in the bottom, like you said. So let's just rinse up some cilantro. And then one of the things that makes this is... Use this spoon. So this is... Every food culture has its fermented something. <laughs> this is it. This, this is a fermented bean curd product that... Um, I grew up calling it fu yu. When I was in China, the the waitresses at the store laughed at me when I asked for it or at the restaurant because I guess my pronunciation was so bad. <laughs> but I think it, my father later explained to me, and I don't know if this is really true, he's just trying to make me feel better, that I was pronouncing it in Cantonese, which is my grandmother's Cantonese, so she always said fu yu. In Beijing, I think it's more fu ru. Um, but it's, it's one of those things kind of like um, Marmite in British culture where some people love it and some people just go, oh, that's really salty. Yeah. So this is kind of a salty, funky flavor. And then we want to add to this sesame oil, which I think we saw was down here. And so we're actually going to get a lot of sesame in here so we can kind of share this bowl. And then we're going to steal a little bit of this sugar and we'll steal a little bit of this salt. And you said you have recipes in. And so this is the cilantro sesame okay. oil basically in here. And then we put in a little bit of oyster sauce again. So this is the vegetarian version of the oyster sauce. So if you've seen this shaped bottle from Lee Kum Kee and it has either two kids in a boat or a panda, this is the vegetarian version of that sauce. Okay. Um, when you go to the store and you find those, either the two kids with the boat or the panda, and you'll see that they look identical except one is more expensive than the other. So it's kind of like other products where there's like a first pressing, like olive oil and a second pressing in it. So the most expensive one is the first pressing. It's the most rich flavored. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of goes down from there. And so it just depends on how much you want to spend on it. On the other hand, the really rich stuff, you use less of it. Right. So it kind of all works out. So we only need a little bit of this. That's enough of that. Let's see, what am I missing from that? Do, 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 bean curds go, and then a little bit of scallion. Let me just grab some of this. So Chris has done hot pot classes here before, um, and I think we're going to be looking forward to doing that again once we can do, once we can have in-person in -person, classes, because sure. I think this is, this is such a fun thing to do with Absolutely. a group of people. It's like doing fondue or doing a raclette or something where you have a bunch of people kind of eating from the same, not from the same dish, of course, but from the same cooking utensil, sort of. Right. 
Yeah, it would it'd be great to have. And I think that, you know, the great thing about hot pot, it is a communal meal, mm-hmm. right? It's the kind of thing that you go out with a group and you stay for a while and you linger over the pot. Um, and so it also allows you, uh, depending on if, if how well controlled your diners are, to like maintain, for example, as we said, these are both vegan bras as we've prepared them. Uh, but we have some meat. And so it, I, I, like at my household... My wife likes to try and eat plant-based most of the time, so if we do this, she doesn't like the spicy stuff anyway, so I just always cook meat on the red broth, and I just, if I'm going to use the regular broth, the the duck broth, I'll just do vegetables on that side, and then you can have your vegetarians and non-vegetarians eating in the same place. Uh, And then the other nice thing, when I was a kid, what I loved about Hot Pot was the fact that I got to cook what I wanted to eat, right? So I really liked shrimp, so I would just sit there and just keep eating shrimp and keep putting in shrimp and eating the shrimp and putting, you know, and I didn't eat the greens, I just (laughs) had more shrimp, more shrimp. Right. All right. So we've got some sauce here, and then uh, do we have any chopsticks or anything yes, hanging around? We do. So one of the things that we uh, there's different names to hot pot, and so in uh, in Japanese culture, you'll often hear it referred to as shabu shabu, which is kind of one of those onomatopoeias, where let's see if we can get a matching pair here. Here we go. These two match. And that, oh, they kind of match. Anyway, close enough. But this is what my grandfather always says. was good about long chopsticks. You can reach very far. So this meat is so thin that literally the shabu shabu is this idea of if I kind of wave this around in here for about 10 seconds. Oh, I lost it. There it is. Oh, it's wow. cooked because it is so thin. Amazing. All right. And then you, know, you dip it into the sauce and then you would eat it. There we go. Good. Mm-hmm. So, I also want to ask you. Thank you. Um, tell me about your shirt. So, Need and Nosh is a little kind of passion project company that I started. So, when I say company, it's really kind of air quotes, but technically, legally, it is a company. <laughs> so, beneath Need and Nosh is both where I wrote the book, but also I've been hosting classes. So, s- since the pandemic got going, I was doing Chinese dumplings classes and bagel classes and handmade pasta classes all via Zoom. And it started out really with this idea of, um, you know, what is it that people struggle with a lot in the kitchen? And what I've discovered is that a lot of people are very um, flour phobic. Like they don't like doughs of any sort. So that's where bagels, pasta, and dumplings with handmade, oh God, with, so when you good. make the, uh, the wrappers yourself. So all those classes, we make dough. Um, and so that's where I've been doing classes. And so I know I've actually got a, an in-person class scheduled just up the road in Wiscasset uh, coming in July. We're going to make some bagels. We'll do Maine bagels. We're going to use Maine grains, flour, Maine blueberries, and make Maine blueberry bagels. Sweet. Um, so that's, you'll find this at Need A-N-D Nosh, needandnosh.com. You can find me there. And if you've got questions about the book, you can find the book here. Mm-hmm. Right. So we've got copies of the book here. So that's great. Um, and you also have a fun project with Chris Toy. So Chris and I have been making videos that are on YouTube. You can also find those at needandnosh.com where we've been doing, it's called Down East Far East Kitchen. And so we've been doing primarily Chinese food, but often with a bit of a Down East twist, but sometimes it goes the other way around. So just this morning, he and I were baking bagels, but instead of just regular bagels, we made two forms of bagels. One of them is a, a Lop, Lop Sung Su Chong tea bagel. So that's the... Um, smoky Chinese tea. So we ground up the tea, made some very, very strong tea and used that as the water base for the bagels. And you could really taste that coming through. And then we also made one with the basic Chinese flavor base. So scallions, garlic, and ginger right into the dough. And and it really was amazing when you bit into that bagel, it just tasted like a Chinese restaurant. It had that kind of scent and the aromas of what you expect in a Chinese restaurant, but it was in a bagel. That's awesome. Um, So we've been playing around with lots of these kind of fusion things. And it's podcast coming soon. so we have a couple podcast episodes that are up those are also you'll find them in the same place on needandnosh.com uh, and so that's where we found that as we started cooking and, and doing videos some of the first videos are very long and we decided maybe the long form is too long for people and so we switched the kind of stories and talky talk and explanations of things to an audio podcast and then tried to keep the videos shorter and more succinct to just this is how you cook this but if you want to know the story behind the pot sticker you know, go to the podcast kind of thing. Cool. 
Uh, and so that's actually why I was, awesome. I was ready to answer the question about MSG. We did an episode on MSG and we talked about MSG. Great. Um, well, um, Essential Hot Pot um, from Jeff Mao, and we do have copies here in the store. We would love to have you come in and check that out. Um, the hot pot cooker that we have here is from Zoji Rushi, which is a Japanese company. We sell a lot of their rice makers and so on. This is really cool because it also comes with a grill pan. So instead of the hot pot, you can put this in, you can grill meat or chicken, you can you know, fry right. um, something on the griddle part. Um, so it's a two piece, three piece if you can, well, four piece if you have the lid and the base. Yeah. Um, so this is really cool, um, brand new to us and we're really excited to have it. Yep. And excited to have you in the kitchen with us, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, it was that great was to be here. awesome, can't wait to eat. All right, bon appetit everybody. We'll see you all next week, thanks.